Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity to present and thanks Issa um, for, for setting all of this up. I'm going to hand over to Issa in a moment, but I just wanted to start just by acknowledging um, our team and our funders. So this was um, rapid COVID research funding from the Scottish Government Chief Scientist Office and what we're presenting today is part of a larger study um, where we were also looking at alcohol related ambulance call outs. Um, and that work is being done by Francesco Manca and Jim Lucy at the University of Glasgow. Jim is also one of the co-authors on, on this part that we're presenting today, along with um, uh, our colleagues at the University of Stirling. And we just also want to thank um, our colleague Ailey Sutherland, who uh, really supported a huge amount of administration for the study, as well as our transcribers, interviewees and field workers. And that is the reference for the study. And we have no conflicts to declare, which we now do before all of our presentations. So I'll hand you over to you, so it's going to take you through the methods and then we'll talk about the results in a moment. Good morning, everyone. So you can hear me OK? Yeah. And so the rationale for the study, you might imagine we were very interesting to find out um, how the measures and the guidance that were put into place to, to address the risk of transmission of the virus in licensed premises were going to work out, you know, in, uh, in practice. Um, obviously, bars are interesting in that sense that distancing and protective measures may be less accepted in social spaces. And obviously, there's the element of, of intoxication, and that is another added layer onto that that was also interesting to us. Obviously, we, you know, as time progressed, there were outbreaks linked to licensed premises that occurred worldwide. So this was a, a major area of interest. You can move it on, Niamh. Um, so this is the aim of the study to examine the management of COVID-19 transmission risks in bars upon reopening after uh, the lockdown, including business practices, behaviours of customers and behaviours of staff. So the, the two main methods that we are reporting on today are interviews we conducted prior to the reopening of the, of the licensed premises with trade and other licensing stakeholders. And also we conducted in July and in August 2020, uh, some observations after reopening of, of the licensed premises. And these were done by pairs of field workers who were posing in covert observations as customers. There is obviously, as Niamh mentioned, a third part of the study led by uh, Professor Lucy in examining alcohol related ambulance call outs before and after lockdown. So the interviews, we did uh, 17 interviews with 18 stakeholders. Important to note here that we interviewed all uh, or, or the majority of, of relevant Scottish and UK trade association. These were people with very extensive experience, as you can see on the slides. Um, and we also had other types of stakeholders, licensing lawyers, local government officials, police officers. Um, so there was quite a variety of stakeholders and very experienced stakeholders. The analysis of the interviews, which was done by my colleague Ashley, um, was thematic. And you can read more in the paper about the details of the analysis, um, how it was done. I'm conscious of time. <laughs> sorry. So the observations, which, uh, which I was mostly involved in, we had a sample <clears throat> sorry, of 29 different bars across Scotland, which we purposely sampled. Um, you can read in the paper, you have all the supplementary files as well. So you can see the kind of characteristics of the venues we, we aimed for. And then the, the actual sample that we ended with, and there's quite a close match there. The field workers were recruited in, in as household pairs due to the restrictions they were from extended household. Um, and they went into the, into, the, into the premises for two hours. Uh, we had the way we, the way we sampled and we used walkabouts and the field workers knowledge and telephone calls to scope out the bars in the first instance using the criteria that we had around urban rural deprivation levels venue characteristics, etc. And um, we then complemented this by online searches to ascertain that you know the venues met all our criteria and, and then kind of refined to our final choices. And if you can work, you can jump in if you think I'm forgetting something. Obviously after after uh, in August 2020 these were these observations happened after the outbreak in Aberdeen that was uh, coming from from bars and pubs. So we then restricted our premises to those that were offering booking in advance so that our, um, our observers would have less of a chance of queuing and there would be less at risk, obviously. Um, so that's all explained as well in the paper. So these were semi-structured observations, which were done covertly uh, to minimize bias. Uh, we had trained our observers quite extensively over two two-hour online sessions on, this, on all the issues around their safety, 
data collection, reporting procedures. We had a template for them to, to kind of fill in afterwards. Um, and we also did debrief uh, with, our, with our observers. And all the observation reports were written within the 24 hours after the observation and it included quite detailed qualitative descriptions of all the relevant incidents um, that they had seen, whether of good practice or of concern. So uh, we structured our, our data from the observation reports uh, into an Excel spreadsheet around all the categories we had observed, whether they were about venue characteristics, signage, ordering, and we had also accompanying uh, kind of qualitative notes extracted from the reports. And in the qualitative incidents part, the descriptions that the observer made of what they saw were analyzed thematically by underlying factor, whether they were more around system uh, failure or, or success, the types of behavior or the staff involvement, the level of intoxication that could be, that could be judged. So these incidents were, record, were categorized as either potentially serious if they were repeated or continuous in nature, if they involved larger numbers of customers or, or mixing, for example, in between different households or different tables within a premise, and also if they involved staff. The characteristics of the premises in which potentially serious incidents occurred were also reviewed. And of course, we, we should say that it should be judged through our qualitative lens. So it's more of a hypothesis rather than a, a definitive um, thing. And then I think I hand over back to Nee for the results. Brilliant. Thanks, Isa. Super. Um, so in the interviews which were conducted prior to reopening, uh, our interviewees were waiting on government guidance for most of the time of the interview. So they hadn't actually been issued with the guidance that would apply when they reopened. And so they were really saying, you know, we need this guidance. We need it to be clear, but we also need it to be flexible. And you could see that there was a sort of tension uh, throughout the interviews between uh, a sense of, you know, we, we want to know what's being expected of us and we're really happy to comply with that but we can also see commercial challenges so there were costs involved in some of the measures so for example um, the cost of putting up perspex screens or the cost of purchasing hand sanitizer disposable cutlery and uh, disposable um, sauces and all that kind of thing needed to be put in place so they were worried about the cost of that but they were also balancing that up against two aspects of the customer experience so they wanted customers to feel safe returning to the premises they were worried the customers wouldn't feel safe but they were also worried that if they made their premises um, to sterile, the customers wouldn't want to come back, that it would compromise the customer experience. And I'll show you a quote that I think illustrates that um, quite nicely in a moment. Um, they, they did acknowledge that there were factors that, were, that, would, that would be a challenge, but also factors that would moderate transmission risk. So they felt as though there were already requirements on them as premises not to sell to drunk people, um, and that they had this sort of prior experience in terms of managing customer behavior, including challenging behavior and drunkenness. And so they would be well equipped to kind of deal with that. Um, but they did acknowledge that alcohol consumption was an additional challenge in relation to ensuring distancing between people. And several of them noted that there would be a need for staff training. Some of them were already very actively training their staff. Um, and, they, and they also suggested that some customers might not appreciate or respond to intervention if they were breaching the, the guidance that was in place. So just to illustrate this with a couple of quotes, so you see here a you know, trade organization representative saying, you know, if we make it too restricted and we don't allow for freedom of movement, there's a risk that that would cause damage and people would say, I can't be bothered. Um, and so you have to get this balance. We've, you know, the name of the game is hospitality. We've got to make it hosp hospitable and attractive um, rather than it being too structured and too rigid or people won't want to return. And then in another interview, I'm talking about uh, what happens if customers are breaching the regulations, the interviewer asks, Asked, is it the bar staff's responsibility or is that really the customer responsibility? How do you see that? And another trade organization representative saying, well, there's nobody else that can do it. They're the only people, the bar staff are the only people. But acknowledging that as the drink gets flowing, people can get stroppy and there's the potential there for customers not to take kindly to being told to keep their distance. And acknowledging here that, that the kinds of interventions that staff might need to make would be more than they have had previously had to make with people who are drunk and that there would be techniques that they would need to learn to be able to accomplish that. So it was certainly a recognition of the challenges on, on both sides, I think. So then I suppose looking at what happened after venues reopened, so firstly just thinking about the kind of structure and the operation of venues, um, we noted that they had made very significant efforts to change their physical operation. So there were new layouts, signage, queuing and one-way systems in place in, in most, if not uh, almost all venues. Um, but with this, I suppose, as with any other public space, like a supermarket or a shop, there were pinch points. So areas at entrances, corridors, doorways, 
um, where it was difficult for customers to avoid uh, either congregating or passing closely by other customers. And there was a lot of debate at the time of the interviews around about whether the government would put in place a one meter or a two meter distancing uh, requirement between tables, between people in premises. Um, and the government uh, agreed to compromise and allow a one meter distance between tables um, on the basis that uh, premises would put in place some, some other um, measures. Uh, but interestingly, we still found some premises where tables were less than one metre apart. So most the distance was one metre, but there were six where we found that the, there were tables closer than that. Um, it was not mandatory at the time of our July observations for venues to collect customer contact details so that the uh, regulations were changing over the course of our observations. Um, it was mandatory, however, by August and in our nine venues that we observed in August, there was one at that stage that was not collecting customer details. There were several more and much higher proportion that were not collecting customer details in the July observations, but it wasn't mandatory at that time. So in terms of uh, the operation, then just to continue with that, um, Again, something that became mandatory later was a requirement to only have table service, but at the time when we observed across the 29 venues, less than half of them were restricting customers to table service only. That obviously reduces problems in terms of queuing at the bar, which we did see problems with, with those sorts of queues in venues, um, sometimes where the queues were sitting in the space, in the one meter space between tables, which then obviously meant that they were even closer together. Um, the, even looking at a very simple system, like just having a sign on the toilet door, there were even less than half of venues that had even something as simple as that to limit the number of customers entering toilet areas. And we did observe some problems around, um, you know, customers ignoring even where that sign was in place or more than one customer at a time from different households entering into very small toilet areas together. Um, and within those areas, there was few attempts to sort of, uh, say, for example, have, you know, every second sink uh, cordoned off so that people wouldn't be close together. That, that also um, wasn't the case in most premises. So I suppose some of these things are similar to what you might find in, in a cafe or in other public venues. What was maybe more interesting and specific to uh, venues serving alcohol was the observed incidents uh, where we felt there was um, a higher risk. So there was a very wide range of things that our observers noted as incidents, um, and they ranged in, in frequency and seriousness. So there were only three venues in which there was nothing observed um, in terms of, of any level of risk. And in most venues, there were multiple incidents. However, most of these incidents were simple or short lived. And it was in this uh, substantial minority of 11 of our 29 venues where we deemed the incidents to be potentially serious. So either, as Issa said, repeated or continuous in nature with larger number of customers involved or involving staff. And the features of those inc incidents, uh, most of those were featuring a level of customer drunkenness. So we did spend some time in the training and um, asking observers to note down not just that they thought someone was drunk, but why they thought they were drunk. So we had um, quite clear instructions to, to talk about what you're observing so that that's a credible judgment of, of whether someone is drunk or not. Um, but these kinds of incidents were you know, just various combinations of singing, shouting, playing music. Uh, there was a requirement at the time to keep noise to a minimum so that people wouldn't have to shout because you emit more viral particles if you're shouting or singing and um, singing wasn't allowed and there was a <clears throat> pardon me there was a lot of mixing between groups so say people coming in and shaking hands with everyone else at a table and then moving to another table and doing similar and tables combining or recombining in various ways there was an example of a customer taking a selfie with a member of staff and encouraging her friends to do the same um, and there was a lot of sort of uh, hugs and, and people sort of saying hello in ways that made it obvious they hadn't seen each other in a while were very unlikely to be from the same household and they were hugging each other so there was um, ways in which it was easy for the observers to judge that people were not in the same household and were embracing others. So this just gives you one example of the incidents. Um, uh, the most interesting incidents are in the paper. Um, we, we pushed the journal to allow us to have a massive table in the paper with these incidents. So um, hopefully if you get a chance to access it, it's open access. You can read more of this. But yeah, an example here, you've got for starters, five men in their mid to late 20s. So, you know, you would wonder, are they all in the same household or extended household to start with? But they were drinking at the table for four. Um, you were allowed at this time to have two households mixing, but no more than two. Uh, and then you see that they're sort of moving around the bar. So two of the men stop and they start speaking to another table with a different household of two women in their early 20s and they're leaning over the table and hugging. You know, kinds of behaviours that would have been very normal 
prior to uh, COVID, but which obviously um, put people at risk of transmission now. Uh, here we see an observation that security staff saw this but didn't intervene. And then also again, the men interacting with another table behind them. And in total, this particular group of men made contact with six tables in this way with no intervention from staff. And so there were other examples, as I say, that you can read, but that gives you a flavor of some of the things that we were observing. So uh, the, I guess in, in contrast a little bit to what we heard in the interviews, um, we did not see effective staff intervention except in one case to reduce singing and shouting. So in the vast majority of incidents, there was no attempt to enforce the restrictions or there was a very lighthearted attempt that was ineffective in changing the customer behavior. And we did look at the common features of the 11 venues that had more serious incidents. So again, just the, you know, this is obviously qualitative, but I think it is interesting to look where there are very stark um, majorities in terms of common factors between them. So all but one of the serious incidents were, uh, venues with serious incidents were observed in the evening rather than the afternoon. Um, most were in a town or village rather than a city, which I think is interesting. Um, and uh, most of them were venues that allowed bar service, although there were three that did not allow bar service and there were still um, incidents in those. Um, and again, in a majority, customers were judged to be regulars. So I think that we can maybe see the logic of why that might be a feature. Um, but we we expected, I think, that busier venues would show more problems. But um, and that may have been the case in terms of the more minor incidents. But actually, some of the, there wasn't a sort of common feature. There was quite a mix of levels of busyness in amongst these eleven venues. So it wasn't directly related to how busy the venue was. We think it was more related to the kind of culture of the premises, perhaps prior to the pandemic, in terms of how sort of social or pro-social it was. So just moving on then just to implications for policy and practice. Um, what I suppose the conclusion here is that the trying to reduce these risks as with a lot of things relating to COVID is that you're trying to modify long-standing norms of behavior in what are essentially social spaces. So it's likely to be easier for premises that are more like traditional restaurants where in the past people don't move between tables and they don't do that. But if that's the norm prior to the pandemic and people are coming back to those premises, then it's quite difficult and um, potentially to change those norms. And then when you have alcohol into the mix, then that not only uh, directly impairs customers' ability to judge distances and to hear so that they might shout more and all of that it also potentially affects their likely willingness to follow new rules they may feel safer or less concerned um, and you know I'm happy to chat if there's time about some of the reaction to this paper there was a lot of reaction to this paper in the media um, and we were you know we were often asked uh, will it ever be safe for bars and pubs to reopen and you know our, I suppose our answer would be nothing is safe but there, sh there should surely come a point when it is safe enough to reopen and um, but there's a lot of factors that will impact on that including obviously vaccination and, and lots of other things um, but the two sort of main points that we make in the paper are that um, we didn't observe any enforcement or monitoring of the rules. So in Ireland, for example, there is regularly figures published in terms of Garda um, police inspections of licensed premises and how many offenders they find in their inspections of licensed premises. We've not had any reports like that in Scotland. Um, and uh, the sense is that there isn't the capacity within the system for that kind of enforcement. But of course, to provide that capacity is costly for for local government or for others or for the police. Um, the alternative, which we have had in Scotland, is where you have curfews or alcohol sales bans. Um, our data would suggest that those are likely to be effective in reducing risk, but obviously those are costly for premises and may mean that some premises feel that they cannot viably open um, with those measures in place. So there's no easy answers here, but I think it's um, it's weighing up all of the, all of the options. And that's us. Thank you.